with no information, no facts whatsoever. Rush Limbaugh went on the radio and said that I inspired him to go around stabbing Jews when in fact uh, three people were shot and none of them were even Jewish and no one was stabbed. But that's the largest radio show in America. I had to face this because of the campaign of character assassination that the Israel lobby mounted against me. And many people are afraid of that, understandably. Just imagine having your whole image of yourself play out in a completely different way to the point where you look like a demon and a monster and someone who hates Jews in public. Do you want that? Are you afraid of that? How will it affect your professional life? The Israel lobby is so vicious that they created an entire site to do that to college students, particularly college students who are of immigrant backgrounds, minority backgrounds, you know, people who are less privileged than me. The site is called Canary Mission. And it's essentially a McCarthyite blacklist whose founders, who are anonymous in cowardly fashion, said this site exists to deprive college students who participate in pro-Palestinian activity of employment after college. And so each student has a dossier. Worse things have happened, though, than denial of employment. A law student from Seton Hall was put on Canary Mission, and he was his school was phoned by Canary Mission. Again, we don't know who these people are. Well, I'm going to tell you actually who they are because, and then later in my talk, towards the end, I'll tell you how we learned that. Um, they phoned his school. He was taken out of class and he was interrogated by the FBI because he was, they were told, you have a terror supporter on campus because of comments he made on Twitter where Netanyahu said, that there's no distinction between civilians and terrorists in the Gaza Strip. And so he said, then we are all Hamas. Um, wasn't even a statement of support for Hamas. Many people I know have been denied entry to Israel because they have Canary Mission profiles. And the Israeli intelligence operatives who interrogate them at the airport tell them, well, you're on Canary Mission. Canary Mission is directly connected to the Israeli government and is in many ways, a private cutout of the Israeli government. Here's what we need to understand as we move forward into the talk and understand the operation that's being run in the United States. It's technically illegal for Israeli intelligence to operate on American shores. It's considered spying. It's illegal for them to run black operations against American citizens. They could uh, face lawsuits and all kinds of sanctions from the US government. Of course, they won't because you know they basically share the same computer. But they can take some precautions. And so what they've done is create private cutouts, like Canary Mission, which appears to be funded by a Israeli-American convicted felon and multimillionaire in Los Angeles named Adam Milstein and is run through the Israel on Campus Coalition or partly run through the Israel on Campus Coalition which is APAC's campus wing through a character named Jacob Baim who has said that he has modeled his campaign against the BDS movement on campus off of Stanley McChrystal's tactics that he applied in Afghanistan of counterinsurgency to monitor the Afghan population and control their insurgency. Beyond Canary Mission, we have Black Cube, which is run by former Mossad agents and was founded by someone named Vincent Cengiz, who is a major Netanyahu donor and a close ally of Jared Kushner, someone who is also uh, involved with Cambridge Analytica, which you may have heard of, that helped Trump get elected and helped Brexit get passed in the UK. One operation that Black Cube ran for a lot of money was funded by Harvey Weinstein. After Harvey Weinstein was accused of sexual abuse and rape, he began using Israeli Mossad operatives to sell it, set up shell companies to meet with people like Rose McGowan and create even fake awards for Rose McGowan in order to get her to sit down and talk and to gain information and confidence from her that could be used to implicate her or to um, nullify her testimony against Harvey Weinstein. These, this was a Mossad operation used by, a private Mossad operation used by one of the most prolific supporters of Israel in Hollywood. Um, the Black Cube also targeted Obama officials, including Obama's 
top national security advisor, Ben Rhodes, during the negotiations over the Iran deal, using human intelligence, which means sending people to follow you, watching you at home, tapping your phone, gaining any information they can to compromise you in public if you're having an affair, whatever it is. They just aim to gum up the works and make it life hard for the people trying to pass the Iran deal. It's a Mossad operation being carried out through a private company that's a multinational company. And this was actually reported on by Ronan Farrow in The New Yorker, who was getting these leaks. Another group that's connected to Black Cube, Psy Group, spelled P-S-Y dash group. There's a new piece in The New Yorker about it today. I, I just say that just so you don't think I'm like a lunatic. Um, <laughs> It's like, oh, the New Yorker, you must be telling the truth. It's not the Gray Zone Project or whatever that is. Um, Psy Group is also run by former Israeli intelligence and military officials, including Yaakov Amidror, who is the former, uh, the counsel, former counsel for the Israeli military, and uh, Lieutenant Daniel Reisner, who is a, another legal advisor to the Israeli, mil Israeli military. During 2016, uh, the CEO of Psy Group, Joel Zamel, who is close to uh, Jared Kushner also, approached the Trump campaign through Newt Gingrich and asked if he, they wanted him to gather dirt, wanted, if he wanted them to gather dirt on Ted Cruz and the Ted Cruz campaign. Never amounted to anything, but it showed how these groups are operating in the US. And today, the New Yorker reported that Psy Group has targeted anywhere from 15 to 20 top BDS supporters, BDS leaders in the United States through Project Butterfly. And one of the key figures they targeted was our friend Hatem Bazian, who many of you might know is the founder of American Muslims for Palestine. Um, they targeted him home, at him at home and aimed to paint him and members of his organization as Hamas operatives. Uh, this is from the New Yorker article. The company said that its operations drew up lists of individuals and organizations to target. The operatives then gathered derogatory information on them from social media and the deep web, areas of the internet that are not indexed by search engines such as Google. In some cases, Psy Group operatives conducted on the ground covert human intelligence operations against their targets. Remember, this is an Israeli government operation conducted through a private cutout against American citizens. This is oh, an attack on American democracy and our ability to organize by the Israeli intelligence services. There's no doubt about that. Here's what a former senior Israeli intelligence officer, Uzi Shaya, had to say in the Psy Group material. Social media allows you to reach virtually anyone and to play with their minds. You can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want. It's a place where wars are fought, elections are won, and terror is promoted. There are no regulations. It is a no man's land. And so they exploit social media so that when you are participating in what is supposed to be the free marketplace of ideas, you might actually be coming up against a sock puppet army established by Israeli former intelligence operatives running an influence operation. And I know for a fact Although I can't prove it, but I just know that I've been the target of it. It couldn't have just been, if, 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 the, if it was just some random individuals acting on their own, they were the biggest losers in human history. Had to have been people who were paid. Here's what Shia also said about their operations overall in the US. There are no laws. There are no regulations. That's the main problem. You can do whatever you want. And so that's what we're up against. Is it something to be afraid of? Are you afraid? I don't think you should be afraid. I think you should be proud that it's come to this. I think you should be proud that in Congress there is now anti-BDS legislation that aims to punish corporations that would boycott Israel. You should be proud because 15 years ago when your group founded, was founded, BDS didn't exist. 10 years ago, no one knew what BDS is. And now they have to fight it with legislation because it's the only way they can stop us. They cannot stop us from winning the hearts and minds of our neighbors. It's not possible because of what Israel is. It's not very appealing. It's unsafe at any speed. I was approached in 2015 when a lot of this started 
by a documentary crew from Al Jazeera. Uh, it's the Al Jazeera investigative unit. And they said, we want to do an undercover investigation of the Israel lobby. They wanted to do, in a legitimate way, what the Israel lobby had been doing to us through things like Psy Group and to get it on camera and to show what goes on inside the Israel lobby in Washington. And they said, can you help us? And I said, hell yeah, I can help you. I know them. I know them inside and out because I'm like a dangle. I'm what the intelligence community would call a dangle, where you dangle someone out there to see what the opposing intelligence service will do. And so I knew all of their tricks because they'd done it all to me. And I knew who they were and I knew how they thought. And so I was the first interview that Al Jazeera's investigative unit had had in a nondescript apartment in London. And I recommended a friend of mine who I had worked on with a documentary, a smart young Jewish boy from London named James Kleinfeld, who spoke four languages, including Yiddish, and had a posh British accent, which is so convincing to Americans. Have you ever noticed that? A lot of British people will say some really stupid stuff, but it's because of their accent. Uh, who is that? Pierce Morgan. He's like got the IQ of a grapefruit, but because he has a British accent, you know, if he talked like Sarah Sanders, he would have been laughed off TV. So I was like, Kleinfeld has a British accent. Just send him into Washington. He's just so sharp. He has no profile, uh, no online profile. And we're going to put a hidden camera on him and get him in the Israel lobby. He'll apply for an internship at the Israel Project. And then we'll see what happens. And within a few weeks, he was in there. He was hosting parties at his apartment in Washington with hidden cameras throughout the entire apartment for Israel lobby employees. He was meeting with the top principals of all the major Israel lobby organizations, including the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, which is basically creating Trump's Iran policy. And he had got a gold mine of information. Uh, gold mine. Here are some of the things that he had gathered in his work with his hidden camera. The Israel, Israeli government had created a unit called the Ministry of Strategic Affairs to combat BDS and its director, not the minister in charge of it, but its director, Sima Vaknin Gil, a former key figure in the Israeli intelligence services Shin Bet group, boasted that we have the foundation for the defense of democracies. We are using them, which means for the first time we had evidence on camera that the Israeli government was admitting that it was using a major think tank, a pro-war think tank in Washington as its agent. And this is an unregistered foreign agent. That means it's illegal. The FDD, he got the foreign, this, this think tank's director on camera admitting that their goal was to paint major Palestine solidarity leaders as Hamas operatives and Muslim Brotherhood operatives, and then to pass laws outlawing the Muslim Brotherhood to outlaw their organizations, especially American Muslims for Palestine. He got on camera evidence that articles published by uh, black civil rights figures in support of Israel had been astroturfed and ghostwritten on the Huffington Post by Israel lobbyists, including by Martin Luther King's former lawyer, that the Israeli embassy in Atlanta was courting, possibly with cash incentives, civil rights leadership, that protests, the protest against the Students for Justice in Palestine's National Conference was actually a fake protest, astroturfed, by a pro-Israel group and that the protesters were actually paid interns of a conservative think tank who were forced to be in attendance, which shows you how little support the Israel lobby has. That sexual harassment allegations against faculty members of universities who supported BDS were fabricated by the Israel lobby. And that it is, in fact, all about the Benjamins. He had a fundraiser for the Israel lobby, talk about how the Israel lobby skirts campaign finance laws by bundling credit cards at special fundraising parties to exceed the $2,700 limit for individual contributors. Where is this documentary? The Israel Lobby USA. It's an explosive documentary. It is the most explosive document on the Israel lobby ever created. More explosive than the Israel lobby book, which was so important. Um, by Stephen Wald and John Mearsheimer because it just shows it in broad daylight. Where is it? Has any, have any of you seen it? No. 
Well, luckily you can see a leaked copy of it on Electronic Intifada, which you should all support, by the way. It's my friend Ali Abunima's website, and it's one of the most important journals. It was leaked because Al Jazeera censored the documentary, refused to air it, under the orders of the Emir of Qatar, who considered it a national security threat to Qatar. Isn't that incredible? Qatar supports the Gaza Strip. They're a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the Middle East. We're, we're told that they're our enemy. Why did they do this? Because, you know, I talked about Russiagate before, collusion and all this. The real collusion with Trump is not only with Israel, it's with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And Saudi Arabia, you might remember in July 2017, after Mohammed bin Salman came to the US and got the red carpet treatment from Oprah and The Rock, you know, he went out for drinks with The Rock, which is not supposed to be halal. Uh, and then The Rock d deleted his tweet about having tequila with MBS. Right after that, he t uh, told Qatar that they would have to shut down Al Jazeera and basically abandon their entire, policy, in, their entire government as an independent nation or face a Saudi invasion, which the UAE was supporting. And so under the threat of invasion, Qatar decided to go to the Trump administration. They hired like every lobbyist in Washington, including John Ashcroft. John Ashcroft, who they called the, the, the Crisco kid in, co in Congress because he was anointed with oil on his forehead as he spoke in tongues when he was sworn into the Senate. He's a charismatic Pentecostal, not exactly a friend of the Muslim community until he was given like a $20 million contract by the Qatari monarchy. And they created a list of 150 pro-Trump influencers who could help them get out from the Saudi blockade that they were under. They were blockaded. Some of these figures included Morton Klein of the Zionist Organization of America, Trump's top pro-Israel fixer, one of the most right-wing figures in the pro-Israel lobby, and the Dersh, Alan Dershowitz, um, who you know, maintains that, um, he, who, who, who maintains that um, he kept his underwear on at Jeffrey Epstein's sex farm uh, during the massages he received from underage uh, de facto human trafficking victims. Alan Dershowitz is implicated in one of the worst uh, human trafficking scandals of our time right now. And Alan Dershowitz has become Trump's lawyer and shown what a horrible lawyer he is, by the way, along with Rudy Giuliani. I mean, he's gotten Trump in a lot of trouble. So Qatar began lobbying Dershowitz and Morton Klein. The supporter of the Gaza Strip, uh, the main country supporting the Gaza Strip was lobbying the Zionist Organization of America and Alan Dershowitz, the Israel's Uber lawyer. They brought Dershowitz on paid trip on free trips to Doha. Dershowitz was coming back singing Qatar's praises. He denies there are any payments. I don't know what they gave him. It might have been more than Jeffrey Epstein gave him. But Morton Klein was getting direct donations from Qatar. The Zionist Organization of America was getting donations from the Qatari monarchy. Yeah, it's all about the Benjamins. These guys are some straight up hustlers. And then came the demand. Censor this documentary. Alan Dershowitz went to Qatar with the demand. Censor this documentary and Donald Trump will start to mediate the conflict with Saudi Arabia and Qatar. That's how powerful this documentary was. That's how desperate the Israel lobby was to protect its image. And it worked. The Emir of Qatar censored the documentary. And as with Ilhan Omar's comments, it proved the point of the documentary, which was the power of the Israel lobby to suppress even our own ability to consume critical media. With Al Jazeera even threatened with a foreign agent registration by Congress if they released the documentary. So luckily, I am not, uh, I don't answer to the Qatari Emir or any Emir. Uh, I don't answer to anyone. Um, my parents will tell you that too. <laughs> and so I was able to make a documentary that was crowdfunded by people like you called Killing Gaza uh, with my friend Dan Cohen, uh, who was able to be in the Gaza Strip for a year after the assault in 2014 and show what life under siege was really like. Um, and how horrible the situation had been for people who did not experience rebuilding who didn't, when the aid didn't come in after the war, how they made it through and how they didn't make it through and how they prepared to resist or decided to leave. 
and Dan, at the end of this film, went to a protest on the Gaza border that was one of the first protests that later became the Great March of Return, which many of you know about. And uh, groups of young men went to what is considered the border, but it's really a frontier with Israel, where there's a barbed wire fence, and they confronted the Israeli military directly, and they were fired upon with lethal weapons, and he filmed as young men came back in stretchers with bullets in their legs and bullets in their head as they protested to be led out of the open-air prison. They were shaking the heavy gates of Gaza and calling on the world to listen. And every week they would come back. And you know what happened some weeks? The Al-Qassam brigades, the military wing of Hamas, would send them away and say, we don't want problems with Israel. Get out of here. It was not until about a year ago, when I was actually in the Gaza Strip a year ago, and I got to meet people whose family members had died because they had cancer and were not allowed out for treatment. And I went to the hospital, the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City, and saw that there was a medical crisis because salaries hadn't been paid and medical workers were on strike and medical waste was filling up the hallways. And so outside the hallways there was a pile of medical waste this high where people were just feet away doing dialysis. They were getting four to six hours of electricity. The situation had never been more desperate. And so the march of return started to take place. And people were called from their homes to the frontier to shake the gates again by the thousands. And they came out. In the first week, 50 were killed. Who was killed? Yasser Murtaja who is a colleague of mine, a, Gaza, a journalist in Gaza, wearing a press vest. He was a very prominent, prolific figure in Gaza, a young man who was shot with a press vest on in his stomach and killed. Fadi Abu, Abu Saleh, someone who'd lost both of his legs from a previous Israeli assault, came in his wheelchair to the great march of return and pulled his wheelchair up with a slingshot and threw a rock towards the Israeli military and he was shot in the chest and killed. Razan al-Najjar, I think she was 22, she dedicated herself to learning to be a paramedic so she could care for the wounded at this march and dressed in paramedic uniform, rescuing people, she was shot and killed and her brother filled her position and trained himself to be a paramedic to fulfill that duty. Young men started coming back in their crutches after losing their legs in the protest. They called them the returnees of the March of Return. Their march wouldn't stop. It didn't stop. They kept coming in waves. They kept getting shot down. Children started coming, and then children were shot. 168 people were killed. Thousands have been wounded, but not for nothing. The situation has started to change in the Gaza Strip. Netanyahu was sort of forced to the table. He was forced to allow aid from Qatar in. He was forced to allow the salaries to be paid, along with the Palestinian Authority of Mahmoud Abbas, who was also an obstacle to changing the conditions because of the war between Fatah and Hamas. And the electricity is now on for longer than it was before. The salaries of the medical workers have been paid after this great sacrifice that all of these people had to be, make to get the world to watch. And we've always been told that if they would do the Gandhi nonviolent type of resistance, well, then something would happen. The Israel would come and the Israelis would come and meet them at the border with flowers and then we could negotiate. Well, they put the lie to that and showed that what Israel wants is their continuous permanent dispossession. Another thing has come out of this today. The United Nations has called what happened at the Great March of Return, what acts were committed by the Israeli army, war crimes that targeted children, medics marked as medics, and journalists marked as journalists, marked as journalists, and demanded that it be investigated and submitted to the International Criminal Court for prosecution. Yes. That is due to the great sacrifice that people in Gaza are willing to make. So if you feel afraid, if you feel afraid of this lobbying juggernaut, if you feel afraid here 
having your reputation damaged, losing your job, whatever it is. I lost opportunities of my own for taking this turn in journalism. Think of the sacrifice that they've made and make sure that they never have to do it again because their lives, I think, are too much to lose. We have nothing to lose here and I think we have everything to gain. I think we have a lot of momentum and this moment is a really big opportunity. So let's go into the next year and seize this opportunity to organize here and to organize nationally and make our voices heard. Uh, thanks again to the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and to Michael for bringing me here. Thank you. Now, okay. okay, sure. Good, Thank you. We have some time for some questions. Uh, who would like to be the first to ask? Tony? Um, you said uh, the, that the, that the, uh, the, the, but the Palestine was, um, the he said, well, 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 why didn't you say the medical crisis was their, 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 their medicine was, um, um, the, the that the medical supplies were piling up. Do you, do you know, do you know why, they, why they were Why are they were, well, the, the salaries of, this is a good question. Yes, the salaries of the medical, okay, the medical workers and the government employees of the Gaza Strip, many of them came through the Palestinian Authority, which is actually funded through the U.S., and the money comes through Israel, and then it goes into the hands of Mahmoud Abbas in the West Bank. Because Mahmoud Abbas is from a political party, Fatah, that has been an opponent of the party that controls the Gaza Strip, Hamas, he often has withheld aid to make conditions worse in the Gaza Strip and turn up the heat on Hamas. And the Palestinian Authority was simply refusing to pay those medical salaries, uh, to pay those salaries, the back salaries for workers. And some of those workers were also affiliated with Hamas. So basically there were no medical workers and there were teams of volunteers in the hospital who had just come from the neighborhood to clean up the medical waste from the dialysis clinic. And uh, that's how the hospital kind of continued on until everyone else's salaries were paid. And, and keep in mind, they worked for six months or more without salary until they said, we can't do it anymore because we can't feed our families, so we're going on strike. Uh, so that was the situation at the time. Thank you. Ellen? Uh, hi. First of all, thanks for all of this. this Thank you. Really good. Um, do you know of any of the Democratic candidates that are taking the right position? I'm not going to vote for Kamala Harris no matter what anyway, and a few of the other ones you've named. But, and I'm even curious about, um, I just found out about the South Bend mayor that's running for Pete the Buddy Gig. Is, that's, that's how you pronounce his name? <laughs> Buttigieg? Budacek. I would call him Buddy. I'm like, I read his name. Buddha Judge? Something like that, but Buddha doesn't judge. Good on the issue. Repeat the question. Are, are any of the Democrats good on the issue? It depends on what you mean as good. Well, you know what's good. If you are a supporter of Israel who wants to see Palestinians permanently occupied, then Joe Biden is your man. I don't know if he's going to well, run. Um, I think Bernie Sanders is an improvement over the rest of the candidates and represents a break from the um, pro-Israel consensus. But again, you need to be in his ear. And I think Tulsi Gabbard's running a protest campaign that could impact Bernie in a positive way. And the rest of the candidates, my understanding is that they will just take the APAC line. What Pete Buttigieg that's how you pronounce his name? I don't like that. Yes. Okay. What he is doing is adopting Bernie's 2016 platform on domestic politics to try to make himself distinct from other candidates. But I assume on foreign policy, I've heard him just... The problem is a lot of them don't know anything about foreign policy. You know, uh, George H.W. Bush, who was a former CIA director and basically played that role in the White House, uh, made a joke about Bill Clinton. He said uh, his foreign policy experience uh, consists of eating breakfast at the International House of Pancakes. 
And uh, you know, what, 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 what would be called the deep state really did have a lot of control over Clinton. Uh, he didn't know a lot about foreign policy. He was a very talented politician, talented salesman, didn't know much about, so he never broke from the consensus. And that's my fear with Elizabeth Warren, someone who really does know a lot about the economy, really does care about inequality, but could easily be uh, uh, malleable in the hands of the national security state and the think tankers in Washington who are all tank and no think, as I say. So I think Bernie is really the best bet and it's also important just to have him there because he shatters the consensus on so many other important issues uh, dealing to do with the economy and class. I think, you know, I was asked at our, we were at a men's breakfast this morning. I had to wake up at farm hours. And <laughs> it got to be, I got to be an intense uh, conversation because we, we didn't have a total consensus there. And someone said, who do we support? And I said, we do not support anyone at this point. We, they have to support us. I mean, it's unfortunate that you're in a red state and that we live in, an, we have this slavery era electoral college where your vote doesn't really matter if you're a progressive in a presidential campaign, but they have to say what you want before you give their support, or at least some version of it. And I think Bernie Sanders will be the most responsive out of all of the front runners, but let's wait and see. Who else? Ron. And you're probably hoping Bernie wins because you can do that education so I can't do, I'll tell you, I can't do Trump. <laughs> it's hard to parody a parody. Is that the question? Was that the question? Tim. What's the most interesting thing you learned in Venezuela? Um, good question. Um, we got 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll take less than 10 minutes to answer it. And I want to get two more questions in. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, told, I, I think, I, I, think I, I told you what I thought was the most interesting thing, but it's like even me, even someone like me who's like this wild-eyed radical or whatever Wikipedia says about me, um, went there not expecting to see such a functional society that was stable and pretty much at peace. Um, and one of the more remarkable things I saw was that in the east of Caracas, uh, there is a lot of wealth. People look like me and us. They're generally lighter skinned. They you know, go to yoga in the day and they have sushi bars and all the things that luxury malls and stocked supermarkets. And while their buying power is decreased, they're doing, pretty, they're doing pretty okay. And these are the people who support the opposition and who most wanted the humanitarian aid from the US, which was a Trojan horse for invasion. So that was really the most remarkable thing to me was the irony of it. Um, and just being there really makes you see how US media just twists our minds without showing any of the human life that takes place there. My, on my last day, I went to the beach. If you go to my Twitter account, you can see the little message I recorded on the beach uh, where I'm just talking about being with these families who are eating ice cream cones and having fish on the beach. They're working class families. And they're just having life as usual. And meanwhile, back in Washington, you have the head of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, calling for an in-military assault on Venezuela to protect its population, responsibility to protect. And I'm like, these people need protection from Richard Haas and the sociopaths in Washington's war state. They are just families trying to have a nice time because the coup failed and they just want their normal lives to go on. So just that for me was the most interesting thing, that seeing that Life is kind of normal there in many ways, despite an economic crisis, which nobody wants. I just wondered how you're still alive. <laughs> like, uh, chemotherapy, I uh, had cancer when I was 28. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, and thanks to Western medicine, I uh, am alive. And that really helps me with what I deal with now with a lot of attacks. Uh, I don't really care because I feel like a mortal life could be shorter than we think it is, and you have to just go out and speak your truth and not be afraid of anything except cancer cells dividing unevenly in your body. Abby, 
mean, you don't, you're not threatened in any way when you get up and say that you're, you're saying that the Israeli lobby is so strong that they'll almost stop at nothing. And yet you're out here. I don't think that they would kill me. Uh, there might be some lone psycho. I was once followed down a street by some guy who got really worked up because he saw me in public and he's like, it's the devil, you know. And I got into a taxi and he, was, he didn't do anything. That's not what I'm worried about. It's, it, what they do is character assassination. Uh, they just will try to destroy your reputation. Uh, they'll use lawfare, legal attacks, and I'm facing those. And all of these things, but I just keep it in perspective and I just want to keep being out there speaking to people like you and, and hearing from people like you and uh, being able to travel and see the world as it is. Um, and uh, it, is, it is terrifying though and it's terrifying for a lot of people who have jobs and lives and families that aren't the same as me. Um, I was raised in a political family that if you know my family's history, you know, there was a lot of attacks um, so I'm familiar with the environment, but other people aren't. And that's enough to scare enough people off. I do think, since you want me to say something provocative. Well, I did find uh, that documentary. I, I, am, I will put that in my article. Yeah. Because it's, uh, I found it right on my Yeah, show. it's been leaked. Watch the, the Lobby USA. But I will say to your question, um, if Barack Obama had given the winds of change speech in Israel that was delivered to apartheid South Africa and said, you must change. If he had done that, and if he had faced down Netanyahu, not over the issue of Iran, but over the issue of the Palestinians, and said, you need to end this occupation, Dallas. Another question. Yes, sir. The future of Israel, from the demographic point of view, if you don't have your children with your birth rate less than one percent, you die within two generations. What's the future of that country? Excellent question. Excellent question. What is the demographic future of Israel, meaning Jewish Israelis versus Palestinians? The current Israeli census shows that there are more Palestinians between the river and the sea, and given that we're kind of in a one-state scenario, that further formalizes the idea of apartheid. The fastest growing group in Israeli Jewish society are ultra-Orthodox Jews who, uh, you know, they have like sometimes 10 children. The men don't necessarily work. They stay at home and study Torah. And the women do a lot of the work. And they are considered a demographic threat by the Israeli government. And so I mentioned the blue and white party, the party that opposes Netanyahu, uh, Yair Lapid, his whole career is built on resentment of all the ultra-Orthodox and the Palestinians for having too many non-Zionist babies who don't serve in the Israeli army. And so he's introduced legislation to force the ultra-Orthodox to serve in the Israeli army, which goes against the Jewish religion, which forbids you from killing unless you are directly threatened. And so they're actually coming at it from that perspective. And some of the most ferocious protests against Zionism that have taken place in recent years and in human history are held by ultra-Orthodox Jews in New York and in Israel, and they are not covered by U.S. media. I mean, you had 50,000 Jews protesting Zionism in New York City, and the New York Times didn't even cover it just because they're ultra-Orthodox. So this clash in Israel is brewing over the issue of demographics, and it's not just between Jews and Palestinians, it's between Jews and the ultra-Orthodox. And I'll just make one other point, just to think, it th think about things in a different way. The ultra-Orthodox want to live in their own communities according to their religious strictures, which many of us find to be medieval, discriminatory against women. They look at Gentiles as people without a soul. They don't consider me a Jew because I'm from a different, more secular denomination. But they don't have any interest in us. They don't have any interest in Palestinians, not because they're Palestinian, but because they're not Jewish. Which means, in a one-state scenario, if they're left alone to do that, the Palestinians can have their village next door. They believe in religious segregation. The secular population of Israel believes in political segregation. And they're the ones who built the wall in the West Bank. And they're the ones who've passed all of the discriminatory laws 
or most of them, against Palestinians. So who's the bad guy here? Because we're inculcated to see ultra-Orthodox Jews as the Taliban and to demonize them, but we need to think about this when we think about a binational future in a slightly different way. Uh, RT, which is, I call it Soviet TV, uh, Russia Today, uh, is one of the only ne news networks that broadcast nationally that presents the other side of, is of, of issues. And I go on there, I was on there today talking about Venezuela, and I have no fear about going on there. I don't care if Russia is demonized in the US. I want a platform to speak to people. Al Jazeera, when they call me up, I go on. Al Mayadeen in Lebanon, when they call me up, I go on. As long as I can get a platform and that network is not promoting you know, hatred um, or racism in a direct way. Hey, I even went on Tucker Carlson to make my point once. I went on Fox News to make a point that I wanted to make. Uh, I'm not going to go on there to demonize immigrants or anything, but I went on once because, and, and you know, if MSNBC wants to have me on, I'll be happy to do that, but they never will. But I'm not at fully endorsing RT. Uh, you know, like any other state-backed news network, they are an arm of soft power for that state. But it's important to learn about uh, these other perspectives and to see it also to watch RT International and to see things from the Russian perspective uh, and the way they look at Europe and all these other issues just so we can understand things in a different way. If you have a critical mind, What's the harm? It's not going to all of a sudden turn you into a Putin bot. Spalatsky, <laughs> Moslatsky. You know, what, 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 what do they think is going to happen? So by the way, RT has been registered as a foreign agent. Um, most uh, of the other state-backed networks are not forced to register. And it's because of what the, Depart the um, Office of the Director of National Intelligence said about that network that they are fom fomenting radical discontent in the US, uh, that they are actually presenting the other side on issues like Palestine. Their coverage of the Great March of Return was second to none. They're covering the yellow vests in France, which is this protest movement that is totally shaking up French society against Emmanuel Macron and his neoliberal policies. No other US network is covering it. It's so interesting, and they're not covering it. And they're covering Venezuela in a way that no other network here including Al Jazeera is. So I think it's just important to not, to just get other sources of information. It doesn't mean you have to go uh, vote for United Russia and Vladimir Putin. One last question, yes ma'am. Everything you've said just makes me feel like we're getting mush, but that isn't my comment. You've been bamboozled. Yeah. You've been hoodwinked. The big uh, the question is I have read not too, uh, well recently, that the young Israelites, the teenagers and young adults, are not really studying uh, their, their religion at all. Now, I thought that was a good thing until I hear you talk. Now I'm thinking they're probably more radical than the Zionists. Absolutely. And that really scares me. Can you elaborate on what I said? Yeah, that's one of the big, the, the question was about the attitudes of young Jewish Israelis. Um, which is, you know, where are they going politically? It's a big theme in my book, Goliath. You know, and I point to a lot of polls, but also experiences I had where I lived in central Jerusalem at a place where a lot of young people hung out. And, you know, it was terrifying. Jewish, Amer American Jews are moving in a solidly progressive direction, except for that small few who are kept in a very hermetically sealed communal environment who still rock solidly support Israel. Jewish Israelis are more right-wing than their parents and their grandparents and tend to be more religious than their parents and grandparents and religious nationalists. And poll after poll published by Ynet, the Israeli newspaper, the Israeli Democracy Institute shows that a majority of them state their refusal to live next door to an Arab and support the removal of Palestinian citizens of Israel to the West Bank or Jordan. And that's because of the Israeli military. 
uh, and also the Israeli rabbinate, the state-funded rabbinate and their role in indoctrinating people the way that the Muslim Brotherhood has in other countries, um, but with state support. The Israeli military requires all young men and women to be a part of the military. And if you don't want to be in a combat position, they'll find a desk job for you. They'll find something for you to do. They have no need for that except for indoctrination. And before that, you have, you, if, you, if you want, and this is like largely among the middle class Israeli youth, uh, you can go on the March of the Living to Auschwitz uh, and learn about the Holocaust. And you would think that would make you think twice. But the point of that tour, and 25% of Jewish Israeli youth have been on that tour, according to the Israeli Ministry of Education, the point of the tour is to prepare them for military service, to teach them that they could be exterminated at any moment, like the Jews in the Holocaust, and that the Jews in the Holocaust went like sheep to the slaughter, and we need to take up arms so that that doesn't happen to us. And the Ministry of Education polls the youth's attitudes before and after and finds that consistently they're more supportive of the Israeli army after. There's a really good documentary that's free online made by an Israeli director called Defamation, which is partly about the Israel lobby and the abuse of the Holocaust. And you can see them go on one of these tours. It's horrifying. And just to close, an interesting other um, statistic is about Israeli veterans, veteran Israeli officers who have gone on the tour of Auschwitz. Their nationalism, their nationalist pride and support for the army declines after going on that tour because they start to see themselves as the oppressor. They see images that they are familiar with from their own experience. The Israeli Ministry of, uh, I think it was Ministry of Foreign Affairs who did that poll. They said, we don't know why their uh, patriotism goes down. Oh, gee, I wonder. So I hope that answers your question. And say, Michael is a... Uh, say a quick word about your book. Just a quick word on that's coming out. I have a new book out called, I think it's out. It got sent to my house. I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> it's called The Management of Savagery. And it is about how... Um, the war on terror was manufactured and how the war on terror created figures like Donald Trump and the far right in Europe uh, and the blowback that we have experienced from so many regime change and covert wars. Uh, it's going to help, I, I hope it'll help us understand how we got here and how we can get out of it. Um, so it's on Verso, it's called The Management of Savagery. And you can reach me on Facebook, Twitter. My direct messages are open. I'm easy to reach, so I'm happy to communicate and correspond. Let's say thank you to Matt for being here.